All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, today we are discussing um, luxury hotels and how luxury hotels and private clubs can achieve profits and deliver excellent uh, guest service, something that is a, a challenge, I think, for most hotels right now, but um, particularly in a segment where that is such a, um, a top goal. My name is Calvin Taloki. Uh, you may know me on Ref Problems uh, on Instagram. And I also am currently the CEO of RefPar Media, which is a company to show hotels and hospitality businesses how to properly market themselves on social media. Um, we will start with uh, Andy, with, uh, introduce yourself, and then we'll get into it. Uh, thanks, Calvin. My name's Andy Lee. I'm the uh, general manager, chief operating officer at the Rito Club, which is in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, so appreciate being here today to, to talk about this interesting topic. Um, so, um, so for me, for clubs, Calvin, uh, when when we look at how things are, it, it's it's you know definitely changed because of COVID. So, oh, and, Andy, that. sorry to interrupt you. Before we jump in, I want to let Pablo introduce himself, and then yeah. we'll jump into everything. Okay, I'm my apologies. No <laughs> Thanks, Gavin and Andy. Hi, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Pablo Torres, and based in London, and I'm a hotel consultant working for FPG. What we do is uh, focus on helping hotels drive performance, based mainly on ancillary revenue. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Oh, that's that's a good one. I have a good story for you uh, today that I'm going to share. So ancillary revenue is right in line with that. Um, all right, yeah. So Andy, sorry about that. Yeah, let's just jump right in. Uh, you work at a at a private club in Ottawa, Canada, and um, you know, give us a little insight about how things have changed for you since uh, the pandemic. Yeah, no, absolutely, Calvin. Uh, I think like the rest of us, hospitality, we've been hit pretty hard. Prior clubs have gone through. Uh, uh, a tough time, uh, depending on you know what type of business you operate. I'm a, I'm a city club, so it's a little bit different. We re rely very much on on food and beverage as our main core of, of business. Uh, athletics and sports clubs. I mean, the golf world is has seen the opposite. It really took off, and uh, you know memberships are up. Uh, you know, and it's almost uh, reinvigorated the world of golf. So there's the seen there's been some positives about about what's happened. Mm. Um, I I think. For city clubs, they've had to reinvent themselves, how, you know, and in the same way, they've had to look at how they conduct their business and how to stay connected. It's very, very important uh, for clubs as a whole to keep connected with their members. So for us, you know, as a city club, uh, you know, we've, we've invested in heavily, not just in safety protocols like most businesses have, but also, you know, making sure the club is safe for members and guests uh, and visitors, uh, but also in technology. And, you know, we found one of the ways we had to really stay connected with our members is, is, is through technology. So things like what we're doing today, uh, you know, a Zoom meeting or a Zoom event, uh, whether that be culinary, uh, you know, and most clubs also, you know, they personalize some of the service services such as takeout, you know, where people mm. could come and pick things up at the club. Uh, some clubs did a, did a shop at home program. Uh, which I found interesting is, you know, they, where they could go in and, and potentially uh, offer some type of drop-off service, but really customize things as well. Uh, you know, and a part of that takeout program, you know, it was really seasonality as well. So if you, if you think about the summer when people do go to the cottage, it's catering for, you know, cottages, uh, having a menu that they can take to the cottage with them, but also mm -hmm. stay connected to the club. So, I mean, uh, there's been a lot of that. Uh, we've, done a lot of online events uh like most clubs so guest speakers we you know we have a good range of distinguished speakers that we've hosted on zoom uh we also done wine and culinary events whether it be uh a cookery class or a demonstration as well as some uh wine makers uh, events where we've offered a, a menu that's been delivered with accompanying wines so really had to adapt and invest in uh, the communications piece, which which has been important. Yes, well, you, you really can't go wrong with wine. You give people no. a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, usually good things happen. Uh, but no, but that, that's great. I mean, I think I think the important thing is you know learning to to pivot. Um, I think most of us personally have learned that. Um, in my, from what I've seen, a lot of businesses have been slow to do so. So I'm I'm happy to hear that that your club is doing that. Um, Pablo, what, what sort of uh, changes have you seen uh, in the luxury segment um, since the pandemic? And don't forget you're on mute. 
Yeah, thanks. So yeah, I think sort of uh, personalization, that'll be a key. And there's yeah. uh, all pent up demand. So a lot of people couldn't uh, travel for one and a half years. So they really want to travel now and they want to make that first trip after the pandemic or maybe the second already uh, more special than ever before. So they really, so that period between the booking time and the arrival, that's crucial now. That pre-arrival, that engagement with customers to make sure that the hotel caters for their needs, that mm -hmm. the stay be the room or the any other of the other of the outlets that it's uh, really as personalized as possible. So it is true that uh, as we mentioned many times in the last few weeks that there is a lot of staffing issues in the industry at all levels. Um, so that's why it's even more important to have that could be through technology, as Andy was mentioning before, or a personal level but have that engagement with customers. So when they arrive, they really find the experience they're looking for. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. And, you know, obviously being the social media guy, I'll kind of talk into that as well. You know, that's where you can really get a lot of the, the personalization um, of what you can do. You know, if you if you find people on, on social media, you can find out what they like. You know, there was... Um, it was a, a great video. I forget what company it was off the top of my head, but a great video about this guest who shared something on, on social media because when he checked in, um, there was an issue with his door. So they had one of those, those, those latches on the door. It didn't quite reach. And he shared that on social media. Then he left the room and he went out you know, to the pool or something like that. Um, the hotel saw it. They came in they fixed it. And then when he got back, there was a, a glass of whiskey waiting for him because they saw on his social media that he was into whiskey. Right. So that's, those are some of the things that you, how you can use social media to kind of, you know, help deliver that personalized luxury service and just kind of paying attention, um, being careful not to cross that line and be, be creepy, you know, stalking people's social media pages, but because he shared it and obviously he had a public profile, the hotel was able to, to find out more about him. So um, that, that personalization and luxury is, is key. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so Andy, back to you. What do you think um, are some of the changes that will remain um, af after we have passed the pandemic, if we ever do, but hopefully we will. <laughs> um I, I think uh, we're not going to get away from hybrid events for a while, you know, so mm -hmm. in-person meetings as well as uh, online. I, I think that's something we're going to have to continue to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and I, I certainly find in the club world that, that that is something that's expected, at least for now. Um, you know, there are a, a section of our members that are just really relishing the chance to get back to the club, but there's also a section that, are still a little bit cautious as well. So I think hybrid events are going to be ongoing. I think uh, e-commerce is, is something that we, we offered during the pandemic hugely, where you could buy items online. I mentioned the grocery service and then other things that we, we offered. Uh, I see that uh, potentially continuing and growing as well for, for clubs. Uh, and then I think, you know, the, the other big thing as well is, is uh, what's coming to mind right now particularly in, in city clubs and downtown in, in cities, a lot of the offices are empty right now. So I, I think uh, being able to adapt your club where your members can come and use their office at the club and conduct their business meetings. So I'm definitely seeing a growth in that market and, and, and certainly more people asking for that type of service. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, I think all, all hotels are kind of doing the, you know, work from here type of yeah. thing. So, um, yeah, especially at a club like yours, where I think it's probably a little bit more comfortable than most hotels. Um, I, I, that's a great angle uh, to go down. Uh, Pablo, what are your thoughts? Um, I think linking to that, it's the growth of, obviously, of the remote workers and digital nomads, call them whatever. And uh, how much has the rental accommodation and vacation rental grown? in the last few months so before in the past luxury hotels will only compare themselves to similar hotels in the area or in the region uh all talking about like top brands in terms of luxury now they have they've realized that the concept can be a very luxury apart luxurious apartment or a block of apartments not not far from them because many uh high wealth or wealthy customers they are choosing apartments instead of hotels First, because they don't have social distancing was one of the main reasons to start with. And then they realized that the experience in a nice apartment is not that different from a luxury hotel. So I think that I see hotels moving into there already. There are big brands already uh, building up their portfolio of rental accommodation. Uh, and I think that's one of the changes that's happened during the pandemic and it will continue growing in the coming future. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, I mean, I think right now competition is heavy for for everyone, and everybody has to fight this uh, vacation rental um, aspect of, of the business. And that's that's a really interesting point. I never thought of it that way on the luxury hotels, but yeah, renting an apartment as opposed to staying in a suite at a hotel, you know, is is something that that people will consider, especially people who can afford to to spend weeks at a time at a luxury property. That's definitely um, an interesting topic. Um, uh, Pablo, we'll start with, with you on this one. Um, one of the questions that's that's come up with with luxury is how to maintain, um, how to how to keep generating profit and keep hitting those financial goals because um, it, this is not these are not the type of properties where you can do heads and beds, right? You know, you still need to maintain um, that that luxurious not only feel of the hotel but you know more importantly ADR and that and that flow through. Um, how do you foresee these hotels continue to be able to generate profit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, ADR for many hotels hasn't been an, an issue since they've been able to reopen. So in, in many destinations, especially lesser destinations, they are achieving even higher ADR than in 2018 or 19. That used to be the record year. So many hotels are doing like 20% plus ADR compared to them. But I mean, it's kind of sort of a champagne effect. So it's a pent up demand will go down in the next few months. Uh, <laughs> so how to continue after that? It's about going back to the previous point of personalization. So obviously you want to personalize it, that comes as a cost. So if you want to have right. the perfect room with the perfect extras and that special romantic dinner and the treatment in the spa, whatever it is the entire uh, customer journey from the uh, airport pickup to the airport drop off after the stay, it's that making sure that you connect with the customer on every um, point of the, of the customer journey so that that is personalized. And obviously you, you're selling extra items, be it outlet or a better room, whatever it is. Uh, so that increases the, at the end of the day, it's not that much about ADR, which has been usually the focus, either occupancy or ADR, it's about the bar mm -hmm. or trip bar. So how much is the guest spending in the hotel during the stay? And lots of right. stays are getting longer now. So it's how much more revenue you can get throughout the state from that customer. Yeah, yeah, great point. And it's what's interesting, you know, in, in my past, I worked at a, at, at a water park resort, not something you would consider luxury, but that's really where I learned that concept of total revenue management. I was able to put that into, into play because during a peak season, if you, we had suites that could fit up to 14 people, right? And you don't want to sell, sell that to eight people. Because then that's going to impact how much they spend across the outlets throughout the resort. And this is where you have to think of, uh, kind of think outside of just ADR. So that's that's a, a great point. Um, Andy, your thoughts? Yeah, no, similar to Pablo, I mean, the, the focus is very much, um, you know, being on delivering the luxury brand of, of the club and the service. Um, you know, there are challenges that come with us. Uh, you know, we, we are biggest expense like most organizations is labor uh, we've seen a you know a big shortage of good hospitality people so we've had to reinvest in some positions to help help us with a transition to train and develop people uh, in-house which is, has been key for us we want to make sure we stay to uh, our promise of delivering that memorable guest member experiences when they come to the club uh, and you know and obviously commodities have gone up we all know how much food has gone up in the last year so we've had to really uh, monitor our pricing structure or delivery of service uh, and really get feedback from our members to make sure we're delivering on, on that promise. Um, because, you know, the club business, without our membership, then we, we simply fall. So we have to make sure we're delivering on that service promise to them. Right, right. Well, uh, we have Sam Eric uh, has, has, has joined the chat, as they say. Um, full disclosure, he is the moderator for this uh, for this session. I just uh, took over because he had some technical issues backstage, but I'm happy to pass the pass the mic over to Sam Eric. Uh, he's clearly Mr. Luxury. He's got a bow tie on. I don't, so I'm out of the <laughs> game on this one. Well, Kelvin, you have done a great job, and uh, I'm really smooth smooth takeover. I would say that was very very well done and a good start of the discussion. So uh, I think you have uh, got quite a, quite a, quite far already. Um, here, so I mean, the issue that we want to talk about also is that uh, uh, maybe Pablo, how do you identify the right customers for upselling? Are there some thoughts that you see that uh, the hotel should be considering? Well, it's important to to empathize with the customer and, and to be assertive with them. So 
it's it's very uh, dangerous to prejudge uh, and to assume. So in the past it was easier, I think, with segments who was corporate, who was lesser. But now it's changed because everyone is booking in, through any channel. So you anyone could be a, a corporate account could be coming through a third party uh, OTA at the moment. So it's it's mostly about uh, that either pre arrival as I was saying before, or a check in time is about the connection. So you need to have every team member at front line, be it reception, spa, or f and um, commercially savvy so that they have these communication skills, they engage with customers, uh, and they find out about the needs, about the purpose of the visit. And based on that, just find out if whatever they booked is exactly what they need, or you can suggest something better. So it's about informing the customers of the options. Uh, not, it's, it's not push selling. We have to be careful not to oversell but it's mainly pool selling. Have a conversation and then see what you can advise. Yeah, it should look deep in the eye of the customer and smile and gently and so kind of get, the, get that connection going and, uh, and, uh, and gently uh, recommend some things and kind of find out a little bit in a naive, curious way of uh, how, how, what are the plans are. I mean, in, in that way, you can start innocently start to make some suggestions or something like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's how it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, some direct tips for, for hotels, how to re, uh, increase revenue through upselling. Any particular tips you want to share? It's what we mentioned, and Calvin also was saying, about the total revenue. So very often yeah. we focus only on rooms from the standard to the suite, but there's much more to, to that. So it, it, that sentence that I hear from, uh, from a colleague is that, why do we always only focus on, on doing revenue management in, in bedrooms? What yeah. about why are we charging the same for a steak on a Monday lunch than Saturday evening? What about a cocktail? Why is it priced throughout the seven days of the week? So it's it's about uh, yielding and, and doing revenue management in every outlet, um, so that you can maximize the the income. Yeah, sort of. Uh, technology has changed quite a bit, and and I think one of the issue has been that uh, uh, you know the pandemic uh, really affected uh, hotels and and private clubs. Uh, it was not planned for, and we didn't wish for, but it fast paced all the technology advancements uh, that could have taken normally maybe a decade to implement. Uh, some things that you have seen of some technology that has been implemented uh, as a result of uh, the pandemic and also how it has an impact on perhaps on the upselling side. I mean, the main one I will say from a hotel uh, and the reception point of view, it's the growth of kiosk or pre-arrival check-in. So guests don't really need to go through the reception anymore. They can go directly to the room. They can open the room with the with a mobile phone. They don't need a key anymore. So yeah. that minimizes the contact. Obviously, we're talking about, again, social distancing. Uh, and that's something that's there to stay. So many customers, they rather go straight to the room, which gives that extra time for the frontline staff to be able to, to engage in a conversation with the lesser ones, with the ones who yeah. really want to go to reception. In the past, many people was sort of punished to go through the reception, queue and check in, always the same process, it was boring. Now only the ones who really want to do it go there. So you have you can have that conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also I think maybe there's a pre-arrival. I mean, before you arrive to the property, I mean, the technology is there now that you can uh, somehow, uh, I'm not sure how many people want to uh, download an app, but maybe there's a way that you can entice people to, uh, you know, plan, they might be intimidated to start to, face an upselling thing that ha when, happens when they come to the hotel, but maybe they're on the pre-arrival. Uh, any, any sort of best practices that you have seen that uh, would uh, maybe achieve the same impact? Yeah, I mean, mainly it still, it still works. Uh, some companies are doing WhatsApp as well. It's, you have to be careful yeah. with data protection and everything. Uh, but it, it's about engagement, really. It's about informing the customer. Sometimes they book through third parties and they don't have much information. Uh, so it's about giving them the options, not only about upselling, it's about information about restaurants, about local activities that they can do. So by the time they arrive, they already have that information and they can make their choices based on an inf what they can have an informed decision, let's say. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Calvin, can I um, uh, poke a little bit into your uh, territory of social media play in marketing? Your, uh, I know you are savvy in social media and... Uh, we have discussed this uh, topic before. Uh, what role does social media play in marketing a hotel? Um, well, it, sh it should play a, a huge part these days. Um, you know, re regardless of what type of hotel you have, whether you're 
whether you're luxury or, or not, um, your social media really needs to be treated as a true part of the marketing funnel. We invest a lot of money into our websites, into, into e-commerce, the digital marketing, email marketing. Um, these are things that we've been doing for years. And I feel like, you know, uh, hospitality in general is behind the curve on what social media can really do. It should be treated as seriously as any of those. Um, I shared a story on, um, on ref problems yesterday because I stayed at a hotel recently and they were signing me up for their uh, rewards program. And I use my AOL address. And a lot of people were joking about the fact that I still have an AOL email address. It's the first email I ever had. I keep it specifically for things like that, for these type of uh, signups. And when you go to a store, they want your email because I'm never checking it, right? But I'm on Instagram all day, you know? So you want to be where people are active. Uh, You know, if everybody's on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, this is where your hotel needs to be so you can reach them. Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there is that uh, effect. I mean, we talked about it in, in some other occasions that uh, Instagram became the biggest, largest takeaway menu with the pandemic, where every restaurant, every chef that had ignored uh, the Instagram suddenly start to post. I mean, you have some very well-known restaurants in, in, in New York where the, the owner and the chef is live just but virtually every day doing things. Uh, so uh, but what changes have you seen in, in uh, the use of Instagram and p- particularly to create awareness uh, about their uh, hotels and restaurants and, and maybe the activities? Yeah, I, th- that's a great one. That's a great example that you just gave. Um, I, I moved from New York about six months ago. And before I moved, there was um, a Jean-Georges restaurant that we used to go to. And um, I noticed on their Instagram that during the pandemic, they started offering takeout. And it was just wild to me that a, a restaurant like that, you could get takeout, you could get a lobster to go. Oh, it, you know what I mean? It was, it, but that's the kind of thing um, that, that, you, that you've seen throughout the pandemic, at least the smart ones, right? I, yes. I think, um, again, this is where you reach people. So things like you've mentioned, doing, doing live videos, especially very early on in the pandemic was huge. You know, having yes. your, uh, like you said, have, have your chef do a demo. Um, and, and do that live. And, and actually, again, to, to kind of show the scope, there was a renaissance uh, that, that I followed in my local uh, area as well. Every Friday, they'd have the chef come out in the lobby and do a demo. And they started putting that up on Instagram, on either going live or showing it on the stories. These are different ways that you can start to highlight what you have going on at your hotel. And it doesn't just have to be F&B, but utilizing those channels to just show people what's, what's happening at the property. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a kind of debate about using uh, hiring influencers and uh, for social media. What is your view on that? And uh, what due diligence should you have have before hiring the the the, the <laughs> influencer who is on Instagram with uh, twenty million followers and uh, and they want to charge you a nice sum about the one post? So, what's your thought on this? Right. Um, well, I think, you know, it's gotten a negative connotation over the years yeah. because we didn't do it right in the first place. Right. Um, any good influencer, social media personality has access to their insights, um, which can tell you things like their engagement rate. You know, don't get too enamored with the amount of followers people have. Obviously, you want a biggest pool as possible. But if their engagement is low, if people aren't paying attention to what they're posting, you're not going to get a, a bang for your buck. You know, if people start, if, if you if you promote your hotel there and it's not a fit and people aren't paying attention, they're not going to book. So you've just kind of wasted your money and given away those room nights. Um, so be be sure to ask for the information their engagement rates, what the demographics will look like, you know, uh, male or female, what, are, what is their audience into? Um, these are things that I don't think that we've done a good enough job historically of, of doing in the beginning. And an influencer is going to, they're going to take the free night. You know, if you're giving it to them, they're going to take it, right? And um, especially here's the, the big one is make sure you have set deliverables. 
Um, I think in the beginning, we weren't doing a, a good enough job of making sure we were getting something out of this. Are you, how many times are you going to post? We need, we need three posts in your feed and four stories while you're staying at the hotel. We want you to highlight this, this amenity. We want you to show this room type, making sure that we, you have a game plan going in and telling the influencer what you need out of it, because it should be a barter. It should be a, a, a one for one. They're getting the, the free night. Maybe if they have enough followers, you're compensating them for staying. But you also need to get something out of it. You want to get the brand awareness of your hotel. You maybe hopefully want to get some bookings out of it as well. So make sure you're going in with a game plan. Yeah. Uh, Paula is here. She's one of the uh, participants. Thanks, Paula, for your good comments. She says, uh, well, Hi, everyone. What a great panel. Well, thank you for that. That's very nice of you. But more importantly, social media must be included in the hotel's sales and marketing strategy. Yes, the influencer must have the same target audience. Yeah. And that, uh, that part is, is critical. That's yeah. the critical piece that I think a lot of people are missing. You know, I can share a quick story where I had a back and forth for hours with the GM of mine uh, because he was trying to get a DJ to stay at our hotel. And he wanted to get this was a this was a luxury property where our minimum rate, our, our CPOR was about $150, right? He wanted to give him a $79 rate. And because he's like, oh, he has 300,000 followers on Instagram. I'm like, okay, cool, but he's a DJ. His audience is not look, is following him because of the hotels he stays at or a lifestyle or what he's traveling. He's a DJ. If we were running a nightclub, this would make you know, complete sense. You maybe want to comp him, right? But it needs to fit. And just because he has, or he or she has a lot of followers, doesn't mean it's a right fit for your hotel. Yeah. So basically what, you, what you're, you're recommending is number one, you should have, it should be in a parallel with your sales and marketing plan and sales and marketing strategy. You have also your social media uh, strategy and you have a very, you, you know, you have to know exactly who your audience is. And also when you hire an influencer, they must have the same target market. And then you do your uh, KPIs uh, to ensure that, that the influencer also have their act together, that you're getting value. Uh, it's not about how much followers they have, but they're actually what value they, they'll bring to, to this uh, session. What, what, what do you see looking in the crystal ball? What will be different in five years from now? We live in the uh, social media world at the moment and uh, TikTok and Instagram are the hottest mm -hmm. thing. We probably don't know what's going to be in five years. Maybe it has changed. But in generally, is it here to stay or was it just because of pandemic that social media became the big thing? Oh, no, it's it's, it's here to stay. It's, it's not going anywhere. I mean, these things are only going to grow. Instagram is roughly 11 years old. You know, that's mm -hmm. very young in, in the life of an app. Um, I was joke around. I've been married 14 years. I don't have any wedding pictures on Instagram. It didn't exist when I got married. You know what I mean? Uh, TikTok is a couple of years old and, and, and growing. So these channels aren't going to go anywhere. What's going to happen, what I'm fearful of for our industry is if we don't jump on the ball now, five years from now, you've been left behind. Right. So those hotels that understand the power of social media today are going to be able to kind of maximize and and be way ahead of the game five years from now. Five years from now, I, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that we are, we're going to view it the way we should view it, where if you're hiring an e-commerce agency or, or you know digital marketing agency for your hotel, you know that's critical. You know you have to get in there, get your keywords right, be, be active on MetaSearch and Google and all of these things. We know that that's critical. Social media should be viewed the exact same way. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, and I think of all the viewers who are watching this session, I mean, uh, Calvin is, is an expert in this. And I think you're doing that also that you can help hotels uh, in this task who are looking for assistance. Because if you look at the old school way, I mean, I was trying to convince uh, my gentleman manager at the time that uh, we should use social media. He said, well, how many room nights do, do I get out of this? What's the revenue? I said, well, yeah. let's start with our awareness first and then we can eventually the revenue right. comes in but i think uh, calvin you would be a good uh, person to uh, to be reached out to for getting some assistance with all this uh, i have not ignored you andy you you are there but i jumped in in, in the middle of this discussion uh, for par private clubs uh, what do you see your uh, priorities now for uh, for next year i mean we have hopefully got over the uh, difficulty with the pandemic what's your view on the the uh, 2022, which is around the corner. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, just continue uh, what Calvin has said. Um, one thing that's been very big in the club world right now is really general managers looking at how they uh, connect with the members through social media platforms. So, we, you know, for, for us right now, and I see a lot of other clubs looking for specialists to do exactly that. And I think it's very important that we do that and reach out to uh, the different demographics that we have. But other media priorities for us, um, you know, in the club world and generally, and, and for, for hospitality is to invest in technology. I think uh, there's some, some business that needs to continue to do that. Make sure we have a strong communications plan uh, that reaches out to our audience, uh, whether that be, uh, you know, our membership or specific uh, uh, audiences out there to look at, um, you know, our, our strategic plan. I know for us as well, this is very important. Uh, we've just come through a pandemic. Our plan that we did five, six years ago is no longer useful. So we have to look at what our immediate priorities are going to be for 22, 23, and then what's our longer priorities. So I think that's important, you know, and that will help us put us back, back on our way uh, in terms of what we know today and what we think is going to happen tomorrow. But I, I think it's always, you've got to reflect on, you know, you can't just ex expect that what you plan in 2022 is going to happen. We, we really have to review it quarterly and take a look at that. Yeah. I mean, uh, private clubs have had the tendency to be uh, very private and they've not really uh, show anything outside for, uh, for people who are not members. But now things have changed and, and that uh, you're quite open and you are uh, obviously sharing uh, some activities and also in, in a way to entice a new membership. Absolutely, uh, Sam. One of the things, uh, you know, that I think clubs need to do is, is, is open the doors a wee bit and be involved in the community. Uh, a lot of clubs have, you know, to some extent, particularly the higher end clubs, they've shied away from that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't believe in that philosophy. I think we've got to be immersed in what's going on locally. We've got to let people know what we do. And uh, we've definitely got to reach out uh, to a broader uh, audience. So I, I think using technology and uh, social media platforms is a good start. Yeah. What is your view? I mean, of course, um, it's, not, it's a very uh, interesting question in the sense that, do you believe that private clubs are, are, will continue? There's a history with private clubs and your club has been around for a very, very long time. I belong to a club in Helsinki, which has been around for a long, long time. Do you believe there is for the for the younger generation the private clubs is a thing that they will still continue to to do, or or they will uh, agree that uh, when their parents get them into the membership that they will continue? Do you think it's going to be relevant still in the future, the private clubs, and why? Uh, so <laughs> that's a very interesting question, and uh, one we thought about uh, in depth. I, I think for an, an aesthetic club, I mean, we, we were founded in 1865, just two years before the Confederation. So we are one of the oldest clubs in Canada. But I, I think it's what's important for us is we have to recognize our past, but embrace our future. So we, you know, we have to take what was good. Uh, we have to think about what the future holds. And we, we have to reignite, you know, that, that passion, that fusion with our membership and that engagement by creating memorable experiences, uh, but also respect in the past. So I, yes. I, I think that's the best approach. I, I totally agree with you. Very good. Uh, Pablo, uh, looking at the future from uh, uh, upselling and, and re revenue generation, what would be some three priorities that you would uh, recommend for hotels for to have put on the top of their list? Pablo. Yeah, one, uh, and Andy mentioned it earlier before, it's about investing in technology. It's very, very important. Um, so because that saves a lot of admin time, that thinking of reception, for example, they were spending so much time just typing stuff in the on the computer. Just, this, the software is ready to do that. So invest in technology so you, you can release time for your staff to take care of the customers. Uh, and another one would be time to hire people with that, I said earlier, commercially savvy, you know, because they don't really have to do that much stuff in, with thinking and admin, they can spend more time with customers. So you need to, to hire more based on the soft skills than hard skills. It's, it doesn't take that long to, to teach them to how to use a PMS, but if you, they don't have the right personality you know, to interact with customers and, and to engage with them and eventually sell them, if that's the case, then it's going to be uh, very, very difficult. So now, and now we're facing that problem that we don't really have many uh, 
talents wanted to join the company or the, the, the industry. So you really have to make the, the job appealing. That So it be it salary, benefits, uh, the, the shifts you offer, or the conditions in general, but you have to make it appealing so you are able to sell, choose the top talent, the ones with the right soft skills, so they can uh, they can offer whatever it is in terms of upselling or cross-selling. And, and one last point is the balancing in, in terms of segments. So um, corporates, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we still will have hybrid events. So some events will, will be, uh, the, the volume will be lower. So you have to, uh, but the lesser market is increasing. So having that balance in, in, in all hotels. So you'll have lesser hotels when you have people coming to work because they want to work remotely. City hotels with more, uh, maybe locals staying to work in the premises who cater not only for, for guests staying in, but also for customers that are passing by and just bringing a laptop and sitting in a, in a quiet, nice area. So it's, it's that mix of different customers and segments that is, is changing and you have to adapt to them. Yeah. Uh, Paula says, exactly. Soft skills are the most important. So she's uh, giving you a thumbs up on this, this comment. <laughs> I, I actually wanted, uh, I actually I promised the audience a story at the beginning. And this sure. is a perfect, perfect time to tell it because it's, it's all about the cross selling and the soft skills. Um, about a month ago, I stayed at a, at a luxury hotel. I mean, they, the room rate is four figures. Okay. So not a place, yeah, a place where you expect the best of the best. I'm sitting in in the in the lobby, which is a beautiful lobby, a space they created with um, that overlooks the pool and the beach. They've got live music. They've got a, the guy on the piano playing and everything, and it's just a great ambiance. So I'm sitting there with my wife. We they bring us a menu that has drinks and also some some light food. So we wanted to order food. This is around three thirty in the afternoon. I called over the waiter. I was going to order some food and some drinks. I said, hey, we'd like to get the, uh, it was like a, a, a hand plate. And he said, oh, food doesn't start till five o'clock. And he walks away before I can finish my order. I'm like, okay, this is, come back. Don't run away. Hold on. We, I'm trying to give you money here, right? So I, I bring him back. And I said, well, we'd like to get some drinks. But also, what about the place where we had breakfast? Oh, they're closed from three to five. Walks away again. And it's like, this may not strike out to a, a hotel, anybody but a hotelier, but I'm like, you got to give me some options here, buddy. You know what I mean? I'm sitting here enjoying myself. I'm, I'm spending way too much money on a cocktail. I just want to eat something that you tell me I can eat because the simple on the menu, it doesn't say none of this information is on the menu. It doesn't say food is served until five. It doesn't start till five. So I speak to the, the girl in the lobby and here's where it really gets interesting. She's like the, the lobby manager. I go up to her and I, I, tell, her the, I tell her the deal. I, and I asked, could I go to one of your other outlets and bring the food here? And she says, we don't allow outside food. And I said, wait a second. Are you telling me that you, your restaurant, just at a different part of the resort, you're considering outside food? She said, yes. I said, okay, I can't work with you people. I'm out of here. You know, but... Any, what we were ordering was a uh, hamon plate, just sliced ham with pieces of bread. We said for the first hour we sat there, we saw the chefs having their BEO meeting in the lobby. You mean to tell me if somebody had not just asked one of those chefs to slice some ham for us and charge me 50 bucks for it, they wouldn't have done it. You know, and it's, it's, it's those soft skills that, uh, that, that is what Pablo is talking about, have the mindset of how are we, here to solve this problem, how we had a service to guests, especially in a luxury hotel where I'm paying over a thousand dollars a night. That's unacceptable. Oh, absolutely. Zaya says, great. Uh, Zaya Zacharias says, great. And Paula says, that's crazy. I totally agree. Okay, we have yeah. a couple of minutes <laughs> left. Just a, a final one takeaway for the, for the viewers from this conversation, uh, just briefly. Something you want to share with the viewers. Uh, uh, as a takeaway from this conversation we had. Uh, Andy, could you share something? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, in, when you're working in luxury hotels, I think the member or the guest experiences everything, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think there needs to be a strong emphasis on that. And, uh, you know, you've got to have a great team to support that. So yeah. we talked about building team members. And uh, for me, back in the day, when I started off as a young man, and I'll be quick, and one of the most important things was the soft skills. It was personality. We used to hire by personality and train them 
the other stuff. Yeah. Then. Thank you. Uh, what about you, uh, Pablo? I think that luxury hotels are the ones who can really add that extra value. You know, mm. no cost is very basic. You just need a bed and a shower. That's it. Fair enough. Yeah. Luxury for the whole uh, customer journey, you can add value at every point. So just make sure you deliver. Add value at every point. That's a great, great uh, takeaway. And uh, Calvin. Yeah, I would just say in a nutshell, when people think hospitality, when we look at the movies and things like that, these are the kind of properties people are talking about. When people think about travel, luxury hotels and that kind of service is what they're talking about. Um, but at the same time, when you really break it down, they're not very different from other hotels from operationally, right? And we need to be open-minded about how to utilize things like technology, social media, and even when it comes to employment, you know, hiring people that don't have a luxury background may not be a bad thing, right? As mm -hmm. long as they have those soft skills and they understand hospitality, you can teach them how to properly, you know, how to properly sell your property or, or, or behave in a private club or luxury. But if they have that, that, soft skills and they understand hospitality and how to connect with people, it can work. So be a bit more open-minded. Great. John Paul says, amazing session, quite insightful. Thanks to the panelists. I, I share that also. And we are uh, running out of time and that's what happens when you have a good time. So uh, thank Andy Lee, Pablo Torres and Calvin Tailoki for a great session. And my, my name was Sam Eric Rutman. I'm with the uh, Studio Puisto Architects and I was the moderator for today. Uh, and thanks to Calvin who started with a great start. So 